Okay, live stream is up. PC recording done. Cloud recording is underway. Thank Backup you. is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Bradley. Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing on landmarks, public sighting, and dispositions. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos for ver verification purposes. To minimize disruption, place electronic devices on vibrate or in silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we may begin. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Kevin Riley, Chair of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Signs and Dispositions. I am joined remotely today by Chair Salamanca, Council Member Traeger, Council Member Barron, and Council Member Koo. Today we'll be having a hearing. Today we'll be hearing the Melrose Open Door Scattered Site Affordable Home Ownership Project in Chair Salamanca's district, the Bedside Central and North NIHOP project in Council Member Carnegie's district and a transfer of a swamp property in Staten Island to the National Park Services for environmental mitigation in connection with Staten Island Coastal Storm Risk Management. Before we proceed, um, I don't see Council Member Carnegie Council. Is he, is he here? He is not present yet. Okay, so we'll, we'll just uh, allow him to speak when he comes in. Uh, I now recognize Council to explain today's hearing procedures. Thank you, Chair Riley. I am Jeffrey Campania, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public who wish to testify were asked to register for today's hearing. If you register to testify and are not yet signed into Zoom, please sign in now and remain signed in until after you have testified. If you wish to testify and have not registered, please go to www.council.nyc.gov to sign up now. If you are not planning to testify on today's items, please watch the hearing on the New York City Council website. All people testifying before the subcommittee will be on mute until they are recognized to testify. Please confirm, confirm that your mic is unmuted before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you had written testimony, you would like the subcommittee to consider an addition to or in lieu of appearing before the subcommittee, or if you require an accessible version of a presentation given at today's meeting, please email land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or project name in the subject line of the email. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of the participant panel. I will announce council members who have questions in the order that they raise their hands. Witnesses are reminded to remain in the meeting until they are excused by the chair. Lastly, there may be extended pauses if we encounter technical problems. We ask that you please be patient as we work through these issues. Chair Riley will now continue with today's agenda. Thank you, Council. I now open today's public hearing on LU numbers 798, 799, 800, 801, and 802 for Melrose Open Door Project. These applications submitted by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development will facilitate the construction of 12 new residential buildings in Bronx Community District 1, 2, and 3 that between them will contain approximately 70 cooperative home ownership units that will be affordable to households earning incomes between 80 to 130% of AMI. The project will be developed by MHANY under the HPD's Open Door Affordable Home Ownership Program. The properties included in the project are vacant or will be demolished for new constructions. So facilitate the project, HPD requests the following approvals. LU801 in the application submitted pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and the Section 197-C of the New York City Charter for designation of an Urban Development Action Area, approval of an Urban Development Action Area project, and disposition of city-owned property located at 66, 667 Claudewell Avenue, 675 Eagle Avenue, 672 St. Anne's Avenue, 840 Tinton Avenue and 842 Tinton Avenue in Bronx Community District 1. This action would facilitate the construction of approximately four buildings 
with approximately 28 cooperative units. Two of the sites in Community District 1, 675 Eagle Avenue, 672 St. Anne's Avenue are located in the Mount Haven Urban Renewal Area. To facilitate the development of these sites, HPD seeks approval of LU-800, an amendment to the Mount Haven Urban Renewal Plan to exempt the developmental sites from the far open space ratio and parking requirements of the urban renewal development. LU-799 is an application submitted pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law requesting waiver of the area designation requirement of Section 693 of the General Municipal Law. Waiver of the requirement of Charter Sections 197-C and 197-D, approval of the project as an Urban Development Action Area Project, UDAP, and the disposition of the city-owned property located at 1048 Fail Street in Bronx Council District 2. This action will facilitate the construction of one new building with approximately four affordable cooperative units. LU-802 is an application for designation and urban development action area. Approval of an urban development action area project for such area and approval of the disposition of the city owned property located at 881 Brook Avenue, 901 Eagle Avenue, 959 Home Street, 1298 Hole Avenue, 1019, excuse me, 1013 Home Street in Bronx Community District 3. This action will facilitate the construction of approximately five buildings containing approximately 32 cooperative units. LU-798 is an application submitted pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law, requesting approval of an exemption from real property taxation for all properties in the project area, specifically Block 2365, Lot 23, Block 2617, Lot 20 and 70, Lot 2620, Lot 46, Block 2624, Lot 73, Block 2662, Lot 27, Block 2667, Lot 1 and 2, Block 2692, Lot 73, Block 2748, Lot 24, Block 2979, Lot 1, Block 2987, Lot 14, and Block 2993, Lot 33 in the Borough of the Bronx, Community District 1, 2, and 3. All the properties are located in Council District represented by Chair Salamanca, and I would just allow, uh, want to allow Chair Salamanca to give some words regarding this project. Chair Salamanca. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Riley. Um, I, I look forward to this presentation, but I want to make it clear here, as I, I told the applicants, Community Board 3 is not in favor of this project. And until they get uh, and um, uh, they, they get on board and Community Board 3 provides a letter of support, I will not be supporting this project. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel is Libby Rolfing for HPD and is Mini Spiliotis, Celeste Hornback, and Matthew Feist for the developer. Council, please administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hands and state your names. Thank you, Feist. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you, council. Thank you, applicants. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation again for the record, and you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Rolfing. I am the Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. The following land use items consist of two ULERP applications and one accelerated UDAP application seeking urban development action area designation, disposition, and project approval, and an urban renewal plan amendment for 10 scattered city-owned lots referred to here as the project area located across Bronx Community Districts 1, 2, and 3 in Council District 17 for a project known as Melrose Open Door. In 2015, HPD issued a request for proposals that included the project area and selected Mutual Housing Association of New York, or MANI, the sponsor, to develop affordable homeownership. 
the project is slated for development under HPD's Open Door Program, which funds the new construction of cooperative and condominium buildings affordable to moderate and middle income households. The sponsor proposes to construct 12 buildings on 10 city owned lots and two lots owned by Neighborhood Restore for a total of 70 cooperative affordable home ownership units. Program guidelines require that the sponsor sell the home ownership units to households who agree to occupy their units. If the homeowner sells or refinances during the regulatory period, the homeowner may realize up to 2.5% appreciation on the original purchase price per year of owner occupancy. Upon resale, the homeowner will also be required to sell to a household earning no more than the project's income limit. Additionally, HPD is also seeking an amendment to the Mott Haven North Urban Renewal Plan to remove the restrictive parking requirements from two of the development sites at 675 Eagle Avenue and 672 St. Anne's that would make this project infeasible. HPD is also seeking an Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years, coinciding with the length of the regulatory agreement to help maintain the affordability of the home ownership units. In order to facilitate the Melrose Open Door Project, HPD is before the Landmark Subcommittee seeking approval to convey the sites to a new owner who will redevelop the development area into affordable home ownership. And with that, I'd love to turn it over to, um, to Manny, to the sponsor, to walk through sort of some of the details of the project. Great, thank you, um, Libby, um, Elizabeth. I, um, I'm Ismini Spiliotis. I'm not sure if the council members and others have the presentation. Are we going to share the screen? Okay, great. Um, you absolutely don't need to look at me. Um, so first, I'd like to thank everybody, um, all the council people, the chair, um, and the councilman Salamanca, uh, whose district these um, these vacant lots are in, for um, allowing us to present to present this project. Um, I am the executive director of Manny Management Inc. And we're an affordable nonprofit housing developer that uh, uh, mostly uh, renovate, uh, um, excuse me, mostly uh, does rental preservation and new construction project, extremely affordable. Uh, we also had approved counseling organization and therefore did apply uh, in response to the city's RFP back in 2015. Uh, in an effort to bring affordable home ownership to community boards one, two, and three. Um, as you'll see um, when we get into the numbers, um, it has been um, it has been hard, and home ownership is hard uh, uh, to 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 get the numbers uh, to a place where uh, the community feels comfortable. As the as Councilman Salamanca said, I'll go into a lot more details uh, about that. But um, Manny is committed to this project and all of our projects in um, in the Bronx um, and to affordability, both rental and home ownership. What I'd like to do uh, at the, for the beginning is turn it over to our architect, Matthew Weiss, and um, he will actually walk you through the design, uh, some of the, amen you know, the amenities, what our thinking um, in putting um, the design together. I think we've been very thoughtful. And then we'll go back to some of the other components of the project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Maney, and thank you, Libby. My name is Matthew Feiss. I'm project architect on behalf of Edelman Sultan Knoxwood Architects. Um, ESKW in of itself has a long legacy of working with non-for-profit developers whose main focus is providing affordable, supportive, and low-income housing in New York City. Next slide, please. So the aerial map you're looking at here basically is an illustration of showing the cluster of sites that we are proposing to develop on. Um, we have 12 sites spread across three community boards, community boards one, two, and three. And a majority of these sites are interior lots. Of the 12, two are outliers and are corner sites. Next slide, please. So looking at the existing uh, Melrose Bronx district, we see that many of the sites, all but one, are vacant. Um, we typically see buildings tall to five to six stories, um, mostly multifamily homes with some outliers as well. Uh, maybe single family homes scattered across different sites. Um, but we also look at the historical context of the buildings of the old tenement walk-ups, brick facades with varying um, brick color from gray um, to tans. Um, and we always are building predominantly near residential neighborhoods and residential districts. Next slide, please. 
So what you're seeing here are renderings of the topologies that we're looking at building. Most of the sites, as I said, are infill sites and also do come from the reign of 18 feet to 25 feet wide. So these are very narrow sites. Um, we do have one site that's even smaller than 18 feet wide, which must be classified as a single family home, but all the other sites are multifamily. Um, all the buildings are constructed of masonry CMU construction with cold rolled steel joint floors. All the buildings will be fully fireproofed and sprinklered. Um, as you can, as you, basically we're looking for a focus on context with brick facades, uh, varying colors that kind of mimic or speak to the neighboring context, as well as um, minor brick detailing at the cornice and near the windows uh, to allow some contextual detailing as well. Next slide, please. Here we see some corner sites. Um, this is specifically site six. Um, we also are providing a streetscape where we have precast panels on the first floor. That's a protection buffer from the uh, streetscape and people walking, interacting with the building. Uh, next, floor, next slide, please. And here we also have another corner site, which is Home Street, um, and where we have basically secondary facades that are on the street uh, are basically hardy plank, which is a composite concrete material. Uh, next slide, please. The amenities of the building, we're looking at energy efficient building systems. Uh, buildings will be complying with ADA and UFIS regulations with design about, excuse me, with design adaptab, excuse me, adaptability on all first floors. Um, everyday conveniences like built-in trash enclosures, adequate building storage, and building bicycle storage will also be provided. Next slide, please. So I'm going to turn over the ownership structure to Manny. Um, and know that in the back of this presentation, there is a very long appendix breaking down each uh, building and this design with a little more detail if we have to end up going to certain questions for certain sites. Thank you. Is Manny you're muted? Thanks, Matt. Um, I wanted to thank you, Matt. I wanted to also say that uh, we may want to uh, 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 share with you uh, each of the sites. Each, um, as you can imagine, uh, each site has its unique topography. It has um, almost every single one of them has a neighbor on each site. As Matt said, they're each um, extremely, you know, very narrow um, uh, uh, for the most part, and they will actually have cellars. And the reason that they'll have cellars is, um, and we're making them as small as possible, but big enough to be able to, 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 to really be sellers in an effort to allow the future homeowners to actually have the utilities down there and make it more, um, you know, just easier to operate as a, as a, as a building. Uh, and so we're really happy to, 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 um, to, to talk through some of those. We have reached out to all of the adjacent homeowners and some have responded and we've actually been in conversations with them about how to, um, how to, you know, how to, how to be good neighbors during construction, post-construction and those conversations are, uh, will be will be ongoing until until hopefully the homes are are, are completed. Um, the ownership structure here that Manny proposed as part of the RFP was a cooperative ownership. Number one, the reason we suggested cooperative ownership was because we would generate more home ownership units than. Um, uh, a, a fee simple home with rentals uh, so you're getting 70 individual shareholders in cooperative apartments. Uh, there has been some discussion around co-op apartments as ownership, and we are prepared um, we're, as a HUD counseling organization to uh, really help um, folks understand um, what cooperative ownership is and what it means and, and how it works and the benefits of it. It is really home ownership. You get to take your deductions and you get to sell your shares as if you were selling your physical property. Um, the second reason we actually chose co-ops is because we um, have uh, a t home ownership in the past um, has has with the city has often been affordable for the first home buyer, but actually um, subsequent home buyers when the regulatory requirements burn off, um, are, then the homes go to open market prices, and that 
benefits the individual initial homeowners, but does not provide ongoing opportunities for affordable home ownership. So we've been working with the city to uh, determine a variety of ways to perpetuate affordable home ownership and placing um, the buildings on a community land trust is another way to do that. And that is the ownership structure that we're proposing uh, for this Melrose Open Door project. Basically, the buildings will be co-ops. They will all be actually part of one co-op. So it's scatter site co-op allowed by the Attorney General's office. Um, so they'll all be members of one cooperative. And then all of those buildings and that cooperative, the land will be on a land trust. What the land, what the community land trust does um, is several things. One is that it actually provides stewardship. I think if you go to the next slide, um, provides stewardship to um, the residents, the individual residents of the building, the shareholders and the co-ops themselves, the co-op board. Um, and as, as these will all be first time home buyers, um, not only will Manny, uh, if people purchase through our home buying program, be there to support them every step of the way during purchase and post-purchase, um, the land trust acts as a steward uh, uh, of the land and is there uh, to support the, um, the co-ops and the members of the, of, the, of the land trust. The second, as I mentioned earlier, is that there are going to be limitations, not zero, there'll be limitations. So there'll be limited equity at sale. Um, so you wouldn't, let's say the market went up, you know, a gazillion percent, the individual shareholders would not be allowed to realize that they'd be capped. Um, but what that cap does, it's not, is not so much, uh, not only does it kind of, it, you know, it, it's a balance between what is that right number so that um, homeowners get a return on their equity at the same time, leaving that purchase price for, at the next, for the next borrower at a, at a number that is affordable. Um, and our commitment actually is that the affordabilities that we come up with at the end with the community boards, with, with the councilmen uh, and with the committee here, um, those will actually be these um, of, um, area median incomes where subsequent um, shares the you know would actually be sold. So if the if a unit becomes a, is 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 in tier seventy percent and that unit goes vacant, uh, you know, and the owner wants to sell in five years, then that the next owner. Uh, uh, a prospective owner would have to be at 70% of median. So it perpetuates affordability um, basically in, in perpetuity by being placed on the land trust and then with the additional regulations that the, um, that the, that the, um, that the uh, land trust imposes on, on the buildings. So that's um, the structure. It's a little bit complicated. The commitment we made to all of the community boards and the councilmen and the city planning commission was that from the time that the project got approved, hopefully gets approved, um, we would actually begin intense um, education and demystification of the home ownership process, preparing people to become applicants and subsequent homeowners, and also uh, um, really begin working with other land trusts that are in the Bronx and others to really bring the understanding of the community land trust uh, model to, to the community. Because uh, there are a lot of misperceptions, both on cooperative home ownership and home ownership on a land trust. So we're pretty committed and, and also just preparing people for, for, for the home ownership, which is being able to actually get a mortgage uh, from, a, from, a, from, a, from a lender to be able to um, purchase. Um, the next slide, please. Thank you. So um, these numbers are neither the numbers, um, Councilman Riley, Chair Riley, I apologize, that you saw last week, nor are they the numbers that um, were presented to the community boards much earlier this year in February, um, in January and February of 2021. We have been working uh, um, diligently beyond diligently to figure out a way to bring the home ownership and the sales prices to a number that the community uh, board members, um, the council men whose district these um, homes will be in and the entire council that is always concerned we know and appreciate around affordability. Uh, and, 
and we will be taking uh, these numbers back to um, to community board three. We actually sent them out to the community board um, earlier this week, uh, and it, it took a while to do this because um, building twelve small buildings in between two existing properties with sellers. Uh, it's not an excuse, it's just a reality that they are, it is not an inexpensive undertaking to do this. And uh, there are subsidy limits in the um, HPD's open door program. We have pressured them tremendously. They have been very responsive to the community board and the council uh, person's um, uh, uh, interest in getting to deeper affordability. And so what you're seeing here are uh, numbers that are actually between 60 and $80,000 less per unit at the top level price. So I didn't put the comparative slide in, the council person has it, we're happy to share it with you. But basically, um, basically, uh, we did a few things in order to get to deeper affordability. One is in the February presentations, we actually had, um, we had some, we had three, four bedroom apartments and we actually decided, and, and we decided to actually, they had a small, each of those had a mezzanine floor. So we just took the mezzanine floor off in an effort to actually reduce construction prices. Um, so that was one, 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 one place that we did. Uh, some places that actually went in the opposite direction. One of the homeowners that we've already started negotiating with had real issues with um, how we were kind of, um, um, you know, uh, uh, going to be aligned with his home since we're going to be right on the on the on the on the shared lot line, and we actually ended up in compromising with him, uh, turned four two bedroom apartments into four one bedroom apartments. So that really had an impact actually in the opposite direction. So, so again, during these last four months, some of these negotiations helped to reduce price and then some of them um, did not, didn't, did not. Um, but basically the, hot, the, um, the, three, the three bedrooms back in the beginning when we first presented this were over $400,000. And the two bedrooms, I'm just looking back at my chart, and I'm sorry you don't have this, uh, were um, over 300, almost $325,000. So uh, what we were able to do was bring these, um, the sales prices down. And even though um, Libby said that the, um, the, 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 uh, um, the program, the open door program is available uh, to, to, to homeowners between 80 and 130% of median. Manny is going nowhere near that number, okay? And as you can see here, the sales prices actually do not exceed 80% of median. And that is what we were able to do. The original numbers had gone up to 100% of median, which is well, well beyond the affordabilities of the neighborhood. The amount of monthly payment that the um, that the homeowners would make were not comparable to the rents that are in the neighborhood. And so what you're looking at here in red are again, not uh, uh, the lowest income numbers that you might see if I was presenting an, a Manny rental proposed project to you. But what you're seeing here are uh, the costs that would include the mortgage payment and the maintenance number that would be paid to the co-op uh, 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 all in. So this is an all in number in red to the homeowner. And what we feel is that these numbers are in fact comparable, unfortunately, given the, the, the income levels and the area median of, of community boards one, two, and three. But in fact, that these numbers are comparable to rents that people in community boards one, two, and three are currently paying. And so that's what we were trying to do. We are trying to get the home ownership numbers to a place where the homeowners would be eligible for HPD's down payment assistance program, which they will be, uh, and to rents, maintenance and, and, and mortgage payments that would be similar, um, you know, equivalent to what people would pay in rental. And, uh, and as a reminder that these numbers then a year later, uh, people, the homeowners would be able to take interest deduction um, that would equal 25 or 30% reduction in the numbers that you're seeing. So they would pay this monthly, but they would get 30 or 25 or 30% of that back as a deduction, interest deduction on their, on their taxes because we live in a country that um, provides um, 
deductions for homeowners and not for renters. So this number, in fact, after the first year payments would actually be, you know, would appear lower because of that return, um, at that tax return. So, um, so basically, we've, uh, we've tried really hard to, um, to bring these numbers down. I just want to be, again, for complete transparency, if you go back and look at the, the February numbers, in order to get the high numbers down, we did have to bring the lowest numbers up a little bit. So we, back in February, we had income, um, we had uh, sales prices that were slightly below 70% of AMI. And in order to get the higher numbers down, which we actually thought was more important, having heard the community boards and the councilmen, uh, we thought that that was the most important was to like really so we end up flattening the purchase prices so the you know so as you see you know the one bedrooms really go from 235 to 275 instead of a higher let's say 200 going over up to 300 we just thought the 300 was untenable and so we we, we flattened the um, the income levels um, uh, the, the sales prices in an effort to um, to to make um, these uh, palatable and it's just not palatable. That's not that's not correct, really, to actually make them feasible, achievable for neighborhood um, residents, and not just um, um, have them be available to people that would be coming from somewhere else. Um, so I think that that is the main. Um, this is you know it's a big deal. Um, uh, I, there's a couple of slides in the appendix that do talk about, um, as I mentioned, that Manny is a nonprofit community organization. We are also a housing ambassador and do housing workshops in rental and home ownership. We're a HUD approved counseling agency. And so what we bring to a project like this is not only is really kind of um, the design, all of the pre-development work, construction management, um, and then actually marketing and then helping people actually become the homeowners. And then every homeowner that um, gets a HUD counseling through Manny uh, or another organization, but through Manny, we actually enroll them immediately into our post-purchase counseling so that we, so imagine in this project, you would have Manny as your post-purchase counselor. They're checking on you, supporting you if something were to go awry. Um, and then you have your co-op and then you have your community land trust. So the protections that we have for the homeowners um, in terms of, of uh, if this was pushing an envelope in terms of affordability uh, are there uh, you know, to really support them, uh, these homeowners and then subsequent homeowners uh, at future sales. So I think that I've given you an earful and I'm really um, open to, um, to questions. Thank you. Um, I would like to allow Chair Salamanca to ask some questions before I ask mine. Uh, Chair Salamanca. I think he's muted. Um, thank you. First, I wanna I wanna thank you, Ismini, and and I wanna tell you know make it put it on the record that I have full confidence in Ismini and Manny Management. We worked on many projects in the past, and um, and she really cares about her projects and delivering true affordable housing to the community. Um, um, but you know, Community Board Three is the only community board that has issues with this project. Um, Ismini, can you maybe really talk a little bit about what the concerns are from Community Board Three? Yes, absolutely. So, um, so I'm sorry, my staff are making noise. Sorry. Um, thank you, Councilman. Yes. So the Community Board had several. Community Board Three, in particular, had several concerns. One of them was that they there was uh, really not uh, understanding uh, cooperative ownership as an ownership structure. And so my commitment again to really spending time with the community board members and the community members at large to really go through cooperative ownership um, as a as a as a real you know bona fide home ownership option and actually at Manny. Um, we've been doing home ownership counseling for a long time. We actually think of cooperative ownership um, almost like a first, the way people maybe in the old days bought their first home, you know, because they're often more affordable than uh, absolutely a single family house or a two family house, even with rental income um, and condos, even though they, they appear to have a lower 
maintenance, uh, their purchase prices are actually higher. And, and, and so, um, so one, number one was just really helping people in the community understand that cooperative ownership is a bona fide form of ownership. The second was um, the sales prices. And their major concern was the numbers on the high side. So bringing these numbers down from, uh, uh, you know, um, 80, I'm sorry, 90 to 100 uh, percent AMI um, uh, eligibility to up to 80, you know, not to exceed 80. And really, even though it says 80 on the chart, these um, sale prices are actually set in the low 70s. Okay, they're like between, they're really 72 to 75 percent AMI. We just put it at 80 because I just want to, I just. I just wanted to shoot myself in the foot. No, I'm kidding. I just wanted to kind of just say that, you know, it, it, things move around a little bit. And so we wanted to give ourselves a little bit of space, but the numbers that you see there really are in the, in the low mid seventies and not at the 80%. Um, so, but their real concern, and that's why we really focused on bringing those numbers down fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 per apartment size uh, was so, so critical, both with HPD's help and, uh, and, 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 uh, and we're gonna continue actually looking for additional sources to bring those numbers even farther, farther down. Um, the third issue that the community board actually mentioned, less, less about because I think that the affordability and, and the ownership piece took over, um, a little bit about the land trust, but I think they were, they, you know, they stopped at the co-op and, and we didn't spend a lot of time on the land trust, but I, I believe that it requires a huge amount of, um, of, of uh, edification and education. So we're, we're ready to go uh, on the land trust um, um, uh, uh, model. Um, and because I think people talk about it, but I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding of how it works and, and, and its benefits. And then the final thing is just the fact that these are um, between um, existing home, you know, between existing buildings and how that will impact, you know, um, mainly during construction or, you know, you know, one, of course, if there's any long term uh, impacts on the, on the, on the home, which there would not be, I mean, anything we do, uh, we protect the Jason homes. There's very clear rules about this. There would be signed access agreements with every single adjacent homeowner, uh, all protections uh, would be, uh, and, and any, and of course, any damages, but sometimes there's actually uh, real um, real work we have to do to accommodate an adjacent homeowner. For example, if our building is higher than their building, then there's actual work we have to do to protect their property. And so these are all conversations we've started to have. Um, and we explained that to, um, to the community board, but we've had more since we presented to them. And they were concerned that we would be good neighbors during construction. So I think those were the four main things, um, Councilman, that they had brought up. And they might have brought something else up to you that yeah. I'm forgetting. Okay. So my, my final question is, um, because the other community boards are in favor and only this community board is not in favor, is there a way to separate the application so that if community board three, you cannot come to an agreement that they can, uh, we can move forward with the other application? I think that's probably a question for HPD. Um, I think another way, Councilman, I, I don't know. I think I'll just say one thing about the home prices. I think the other thing I can do, I mean, I, you're a Councilman for all of them. All three neighborhoods are, are, are very low income neighborhoods. And, 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 and we want to provide home ownership to the residents. There will be a 50% preference to residents in this community. And so we wanna have those prices to make sure that we actually meet that meet and exceed that community preference. Like, you know, we do on the rental units. Um, and we don't wanna make a number that we could say it's 50%, but we would never get there. Um, I think one thing we could look at, and again, we can talk about it offline, is, um, you know, the, the each, each building has to get to these numbers. They all have these like little ranges, you know, it's very flat, but they're ranges. And I'm, I can look to see, we didn't, um, I didn't focus specifically on, let's say the community board three buildings having the lowest numbers, but if that's something given that the community boards approved the project at much higher numbers, which means the numbers we're coming in for board one and two are much lower than the presentations they saw. If we were to take the numbers, the absolutely lowest numbers that are in our 
pro forma and apply those to the CB3 houses and bring that down even a little bit more, that that might make it even more, um, more um, uh, palette, you know, more, 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 more um, acceptable to, to, to Chairman Rivera and, 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 and the district manager. So that's also another idea. Um, I mean, the problem, and I'll just say the problem is scatter site um, construction of 12 sites is expensive and scatter site of uh, six sites is going to actually be more expensive. So I'm worried that if we were to remove these and split them out, that some costs would go up. Soft costs for sure, if we closed that separately or moved it somewhere else. Um, and so I think I'd rather really work with you and the community board to try to get to numbers that they think that they think are, are acceptable. But we can talk to HPD about the other option. Yes, council member, I just want to add on to what Asmini was just saying that um, I believe that um, it, that it may be possible and we can certainly, um, you know, go back to the team at HBD to talk about what would be possible in terms of splitting. But I, you know, I'm conscious of the fact that it there it is about half of the, the sites and so in community board three and I I think that the team would be concerned about the financial feasibility of the whole project and so we would, you know, obviously hate to lose an opportunity if there's, you know, still a path to really, to really working with the community board to, you know, to sort of demonstrate how much, um, how much work Manny and HPD has done to, to bring down that affordability and it make sure that, um, you know, if there's more opportunities. I mean, it would just be a lot of, a lot of co-ops that we'd be losing. And so, you know, we could certainly explore that, um, but we would have concerns about the cost um, and making maybe the rest, the remaining sites harder to finance at these these lower AMI levels. Um, so that would be a concern, but happy to, to explore that. Okay, well, I, I, I thank you for that information and let's continue to talk. I know we're not gonna vote on this project today, but there's still more time. Um, and let's see if we can get to the finish line. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Really, really appreciate it. And yes, we'll be in touch. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. I'm going to ask a few questions, then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Councilman Miller, to ask some questions. Uh, so the first question is, the project sites were acquired by the city by in REM foreclosure between 1975 and 1990. How many of the sites required demolition? How did those sites come to be vacant and how long have they been vacant for? Um, I, I don't know if I have all of the dates of how long they've been vacant um, for each of the sites, but I, I'm sure that we can um, look into that for each of the sites and get that back to you in a chart. Thank you, Libby. Sure. Um, my next question is the project consists of three separate UDAP actions in three different community districts. Why has HPD submitted them as one project and what would happen to the project if the council were to approve some of the UDAPs and not all of them? I would say that um, we obviously could look at that. We, in our mind, um, this RFP grew out of an effort, um, you know, I think there's Back in the day, the city had you know large amount of of city owned vacant sites that it could develop um, for affordable housing. And over the years, we've through a lot of effort have pushed a lot of the the housing into um, affordable um, home ownership and rentals, and have developed a lot of those sites. And so many of the sites that are remaining are as as many um, and Matt pointed out, they're they're very small sites. They're often hard to develop, and um, it's often hard for one developer to have the, the cost of doing just one small site. Um, there's no scale in that. And so it's becoming very hard to dispose of those sites. And so this um, RFP was an effort to really cluster those sites together and try to um, to match the, the, the sites to developers who could find a way to do a larger project, but across all of these sites. And I think that when you take some of the sites out, you you bring you sort of 
undermine that scale issue. And so I think it makes it harder um, for us to finance those projects. It, it drives up the cost, makes it harder for us to achieve the low, the low afford, the deep affordability that we want. Um, and so again, it's not impossible to, to take them apart, but we think of them as one project and we are financing them as one project. So I um, apologize that it ends up being confusing um, when we bring on all these different um, actions, but that, that is why we, because we think of them as one project. Thanks, Libby. And just one more question. Uh, the project is going to be marketed to households making 80 to 130% of AMI. What percent of the households in community one, two, and three make more than 80% of the AMI? Does HPD expect the units? Uh, does HPD expect that these units will still be afforded with people currently? I actually, um, I don't know if it's my computer. I, I'm sorry, I had a hard time hearing the questions or any way you could repeat it. Yes, I'll repeat it. So the project is going to be marketed to households making 80 to 130% of AMI. Uh, what percent of households in community districts one, two, and three make more than 80% of the AMI? And does HPD expect that these units will still be affordable to people who currently live um, I believe the last part of your question would be whether it'd be hard to, to, to market it and to actually find people to purchase it at the prices. I mean, I, I do want to, I, I want to allow Ismini to also weigh in here. Um, I think that we are, the team is working really hard to, um, to bring that affordability down. I think we're at, you know, under 80% AMI um, now. Um, I don't actually have stats in front of me on what um, the the income um, ranges in the in those in the different community boards, but we could certainly um, follow up on that. Um, but I think our feeling is that, um, you know, obviously we want to make sure that we are pricing the the Co -op, the co-ops in a way that they are within reach. And I think that's the, the work that Manny has been doing. Um, so we very much think there is um, a market for, for these homeowner ownership opportunities. And we hear a lot from, from communities that they want um, they want that opportunity to have home ownership and not just rentals. Um, so, so we think there, there is a market and that we'll be able to market them. But Ismini, I don't know if you wanna yeah. add anything there. Yes, I would. Thank you, um, Chairman Riley. Um, thanks, Libby. I wanted to say that um, we will not be marketing the um, cooperatives to people at 130% of AMI. Okay, I think what's really, really important here, and we do this on the rental side too. I think I gave this example to you, Chairman, last week. You know, uh, so when we when we set when you put out a marketing ad, you know, you have all these bands, right? So you've got the, you know, you might have units at 40%, 50%, 60%, you know, and so what we what we did and we fought, you know, we fought for this 20 years ago. Basically, the 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 reason there are bands of income and eligibility, like why there's a 70% band and an 80% band, is that if you're looking that people should should pay no more than let's say 30% of their income in rent or for home ownership if you're saying that the that that people uh you know the banks like people to pay like 33 to 35% right they're they're all they're all in housing costs well you could imagine that if i worked so hard to get these numbers where they are today right you know uh, at uh, 70 to 80% ami homeowner right? And then suddenly I make it available to a person 130% who makes almost twice as much, right? 130% is almost double 70%, right? So if you made 130% AMI and I made 70% AMI, okay? Again, we, it's a lottery, so maybe you'll, I'll get a better number, but the chances that your credit's better, that you're, you know, you know that you are going to be like, oh, not so anxious about it, you know, no matter how many supports I provide to the 70% AMI person, you know, it opens the pool up. And what this means with these prices where they are, that that 130% AMI person will not be paying 35% of their income towards the housing costs. They will be paying much closer to 20% of their, of, their, of their income towards housing costs. That would be unequal, uh, unfair. So what happens is uh, we, we actually, the way we've set it up with HPD, and again, we can talk about this as, as the project moves forward, is that the income eligible applicants will not exceed 90% of AMI, 
Okay, so the houses will be eligible basically because they range in price from like 72% AMI, the sales prices to like 75 or 76. Basically, people making a little bit under 70 are eligible for these homes and people no more than 90. Okay, so we capped it. So even though the program itself, and you'll see other homeowners, um, other developers will come before you. I don't know what neighborhoods they're in. They will come before you and they will have their sale prices at 110 and 120 and 130. Manny took those off the table. They've never, you can, and HPD can attest to it. We, we I mean, the fact that I had to show up at 103% was killing me, you know? And so the fact that we have dropped those numbers down to, uh, to eligibility between 70 and 80. The last thing we wanna do is allow a person making 130% of I, AMI to take advantage of that lower number. We actually want uh, uh, um, the, the, the homeowner income to match uh, the, 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 the payment, right? The, the eligibility payment, just like you do in rentals, okay? We have a person, if I have a 40% AMI band and the rent is $700 and I have a, a person making $60,000, so they're at an 80% AMI, double 40, they'll look at the ad and they'll be like, oh, look, I want that $700 rent. I'm like, oh, you're not getting it, okay? You don't get the $700 rent. You get the $1,400 rent because you're making 80% of AMI. The person who gets the $700 rent is making half your income and each of you should pay 30% of your income. And so that's HPD's rule around uh, FAIR and how the distributions happen. We're applying that same concept here. And so I am happy to look into the data and I am hopeful, okay, and again, I don't want to pretend, we looked at the rents in the neighborhood comparable to these uh, monthly costs, okay? What we can do is we can look to see what are the, in, what, how many of the people in community boards one, two, and three are in the 60, 70, 80, and 90% AMI range. We don't have to go to 110, 120, 130 because we're not marketing to them. So we're only, but we can get that data for you, but we're not going over 90 because we're not selling to people over 90. Okay. If you can't get that data to me, it'd be very helpful. Am I making sense? Um, yeah. Okay. We've, we've just been joined by Council Member Miller and, and Council Member Cornegie. I see Council Member Miller has his hand up. Um, so I'm going to allow him to ask his question um, now. Council Member Miller. Thank you, Chair Riley. Uh, appreciate you, brother. Um, and uh, uh, Chair Salamanca, if you're still on, um, I love the program. And, and as many is okay. Okay. She, she's okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. And, and, and we've, we've done a, a tremendous amount of work as well in, in, in Southeast Queens. And I think um, what they do best is the community engagement piece um, that other folks don't do and, and make sure that these programs really contour to fit, fit AMIs and, and other needs and values of the community. So that is good. So um, do we have, what is maintenance on the uh, on these uh, units look like now? Do we know? Yes, Councilman. Um, what we're looking at, uh, we have a range um, and we're looking, and, and again, these are ranges and they're actually reflective of people putting down 5% towards the sales price. Right. Um, and, and as, you, as you know, with the homeownership programs that we've done with you in your district, people can put down as little as 3%, which would make the mortgage a little bit higher. And they could also um, put down more than 5%. They could put 10% down, particularly because um, uh, uh, in co-ops, the closing costs for co-ops are much lower than they are for fee simple houses and for condos, okay, which are considered single family homes. Right. And so what happens, the closing costs are only kind of, they could be like two to $4,000, including your legal fees, everything all in. And so what happens is if you're eligible for the HPD's down payment assistance program, you can actually take the down payment assistance program money and apply it to reduce your purchase price, okay? Right. And, so, and so without your own money, you might only have, you know, 5% of your own money, but you could take the, 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 the federal money that comes in through, through the city for down payment and lower your number even more. So these are, I, I, would, I would say these are like the highest maintenance numbers that people would have to pay. Okay, so again, I just wanted to explain to you, um, okay. um, but we're looking at, at, at maintenance of 1400 
to 1600, you know, it's like 1400 to 1575 for studio, uh, 1800 to 1900 for a one bedroom, uh, 2100 to 2300 for a two bedroom and 2500 to 2700, I'm rounding the numbers for a three bedroom. Uh, and so uh, they are absolutely not the rents that I was saying at a 40% AMI, $700 rent, $800 rent. But what I was saying, I think before you got on, these numbers also include their everything. They're the mortgage. Yeah. Right, right. exactly. Go. And you'll be able to take uh, all of your interest payments and deduct them in your next year's taxes. So we're looking that that number reduced by 30% is really what you'll be paying because in our United States of America today, homeowners get the deduction and renters don't. And so 30% of that number actually comes back to you in an interest deduction. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is good. So um, I, I was looking at the, the AMIs and um, at, at this course, uh, and, and, and so obviously different places, you know, we, we had a, a plethora of AMIs when we worked together and, and, and so that they made sure that everybody in the community had access to, to, to housing, those at, at both ends of the spectrum. Um, but it appears that on average, we're looking at 33 to 35% of, of, of earnings um, at, at these numbers here. Yeah. And, and I know you said that you were working to get it down. Is that to be a little more consistent with the 30, kind of the 30% model that, that we're looking at um, in terms of uh, um, uh, household income? So we're being very conservative here and HPD required us um, to be very conservative. So basically, and you can check with anyone, you can check with um, neighborhood housing services in Jamaica, you can check with, you know, with, uh, with uh, any um, HUD counseling organization and mm -hmm. with any bank. And we actually had sent these term sheets to the bank, um, to HPD, but they really, really wanted us to be conservative. So basically when we help people become homeowners, even, and they did not, um, they did not fail during either housing crisis uh, if they had been counseled, you can actually go even higher, okay? So the bank actually often underwrites to 38% of, in, you know, 30%, okay, back end ratio, you know, in terms of what your payments can be, and right. sometimes goes even over 40, okay? Because they know that you're gonna get that deduction. HPD was extremely, um, you know, uh, um, you know con they were conservative. They did not want us to put those kinds of numbers out there. But I can tell you that, uh, that people will be eligible. So if somebody comes in and they are, um, and, they, and, they have a, and we have a bank product that allows them to, uh, that allows us to underwrite at 38% uh, back end ratio, then these AMIs come down. Okay, that people with lower incomes are eligible for these homes. Mm -hmm. And we will be working with our banks and with HPD to get that link made so that then we can actually, if we, so basically if we were to go out to market with this, with this screenshot, um, people who were under, um, uh, you know, under 51,000, for example, for a studio might not apply, or we might get, send them a letter that says too low, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're under income. But I'm saying that if, the, if we were writing to a 38 back, rate, back end ratio, that number might actually be 45,000, okay? So now that band of eligibility in terms of home buyers is from 45 to, to, to 55 or 60, right? And, and not just this 51 to 53. And right. so that's what we're gonna be working on. We just didn't present it, which actually makes our numbers look worse than what we think will actually happen, which makes it hard to explain to community boards and community residents who are really, really worried that their people are gonna be left out. But okay. um, we, we just didn't want to overpromise either because I don't want to come back and you and you tell me, Mimi, you said that people at forty five thousand dollars could buy, and now you're telling me they can't. I'd rather tell you it's at fifty, and suddenly a forty five thousand dollar income person buys, you know. And so that's kind of that's kind of where we were balancing the presentation. Okay, thank you, thank thank you, Mimi. I appreciate you. We. we 
uh, uh, you guys were also on with the presentation that the caucus did last week. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Chair Riley, uh, for giving me a moment and look forward to continuing this conversation and being a part of this project and others. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Uh, Councilmember Barron. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a brief comment. I just want to say that we've had a long standing relationship with Manny and his Mimi. And as has been said previously, they have demonstrated that they have an understanding of being sensitive to the existing community as they bring projects in. And I just hope that since uh, Council Member Salamanca and I have a friendly competition going here in terms of bringing in housing into our communities that will not displace residents that are living there, that will not contribute to gentrification, that I look forward to a resolution so that the local council member will be able to bring this forward with his support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you, Council Member Barron. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, uh, the panel is excused. Thank you. Chairman Riley, thank you so much. Thank you all, all the council people. Okay. So before we start our next hearing, uh, council, are there any public testimonies for the Melrose Open Door? At this time, all witnesses intending to testify on these items should log in or call into Zoom. We will wait one moment, see if there are any members of the public. There are no members of the public signed up to testify on these items. There being no members of the public who is to testify on these items, the public hearing on LU numbers 798, 799, 800, 801, and 802 related to the Melrose Open Door Project are now closed and items are laid over. We will now be moving to LU 803 and 804, the Best Eye Knee Hop Cluster. And before we begin, I would like to allow my colleague, Councilmember Cornegy, uh, some time to give some remarks regarding this project. Councilmember Cornegy. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So thank you so much, Council Member Riley and all the subcommittee members, Council Member Salamanca and all the many agency and council staff and community members who've worked on this open door bed Central and North 2 project. I'd like to briefly reiterate my remarks in support of this application. I'm supportive of this project for LU 0670 2020 because it ties in the longstanding concern I've had with housing. Affordable rentals are incredibly important, but too often providing a pathway to affordable home ownership is overlooked. Providing home ownership opportunities and providing households in our shared communities with a pathway to building wealth through home ownership is a part of housing policy we need to continue to focus on. We need the opportunities for intergenerational wealth building home ownership provides. Home ownership also links with flexibility and standing in starting a small business and pursuing entrepreneurship, higher education, and serving as engaged stakeholders in, in communities. I'm also grateful for the work that the developer and their team has done with respect to community engagement. Gaining the unanimous support of the community board and the landmarks preservation were important in my support of this. Also important, the engagement they've had with my office, meeting with me and my staff, answering questions and really actively helping us all understand their mission and vision and how that fits into the future of our community. Thanks again to the subcommittee for considering this important land use item this afternoon. And I really look forward to the important project proceeding in my district. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cornegy, and thank you for all your hard work uh, in getting this project to your residents in your community. Our next item, two items related to the Best Star Central and North Nehop cluster project. LU803 is an application submitted by HPD requesting approval of the designation of an herbal development action area and an urban development action area project for such area and the disposition of city owned property in LU804 is an application submitted by HPD requesting approval of an exemption, exemption from real property taxation pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. Both items are related to four 
vacated city owned properties located at 187 and 187 R Chauncey Street, 772 Myrtle Ave, 890 Myrtle Ave, and 119 125 Vernon Ave in Best neighborhood of Brooklyn and Councilmember Cornegie's district. If approved, these actions will facilitate the construction of approximately 45 affordable home ownership cooperative units distributed across four sites. The sale price for such unit will be affordable for household with incomes between 80 and 130% of the area medium income. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel for these items is Libby Rolfing, uh, Deputy Commissioner of HPD, Olga Joby or Hobi, Benjamin Shevolian, and James Ship for the developer. Council, please administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hands and state your names. Elizabeth Rolfing. James Ship. Olga Job. You're having some difficulty uh, there. Do you please raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee in answer to all council member questions? Yes. I do. Thank you. Before you begin, please state your name and affiliation for the record, and then you may begin. Great. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Rolfing. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. This pre-considered item consists of a ULERP application for a project known as bed -Stuy Central and North Phase 2 that seeks urban development action area designation, project, and disposition approval for eight city-owned vacant scattered lots located in Brooklyn Council District 36 and referred to here as the project area. In 2015, HPD issued a request for proposals that included the project area and selected Shelter Rock Builders LLC, the sponsor, to develop affordable home ownership. Under HPD's open door program, the city-owned parcels will be conveyed to Restored Homes Housing Development Fund Corporation who will partner with the sponsor to construct four new construction buildings containing approximately 45 affordable cooperative home ownership units for the proposed development. The proposed development will also include approximately 3,850 square feet of commercial space across two of the four sites as required by zoning and will be built to meet enterprise green housing standards. Once completed, the cooperative will sell the units to households who agree to own or occupy their homes for the length of the regulatory period. As part of the open door program, the purchaser will be required to abide by resale restrictions. If the homeowner sells or refinances during the regulatory period, the homeowner may realize up to 2% appreciation on the original purchase price per year of owner occupancy. Additionally, the homeowner will also be required to sell to a household earning no more than the project's income limit. In addition to approval of the ULERP application, HPD seeks approval of an Article 11 tax benefit for the pre-considered items related to the bed -Stuy Central and North Phase 2 project in order to help maintain affordability for these home ownership units. The term of the tax exemption will be 40 years that will be coterminous with the regulatory agreement. Today, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of bed -Stuy Central and North Phase 2 in order to facilitate construction of this affordable home ownership project. Thank you. And with that, I'd love to turn it over to the development team. Hi, right, can you hear me? Um, okay, I will share my screen and hopefully you can know. Oh, our, Libby, will you share the screen? I think they'll put it on for you. Ah, great, thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon. My name is Olga Job. Um, I am with Aries Consulting, <coughs> excuse me. And I'm a consultant working with um, Ben Chevolian and Shelter Rock Builders, the developer and sponsor of bed -Stuy Central in North Phase Two. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, as Libby mentioned, uh, they, these are four sites located in Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. Um, 772 Myrtle, 890 Myrtle, 119 to 125 Vernon, and 187 Chauncey Street. Next slide, please. The first building um, is 187 Chauncey Street. Um, this is a four-story walk-up um, that is <clears throat> comprised of seven units, which are six one bedrooms and one two bedroom unit, which is on the ground floor. Um, the building has been designed um, to be weaved into the fabric of the architectural context of a Brooklyn brownstone. Um, it is set back to provide some buffer for the unit owner on the ground floor. The building will feature a landscape rear yard and will also have um, storage available um, by both bike storage and unit owner storage for the residents. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 772 Myrtle and 890 Myrtle are what I like to refer to as sister buildings. Um, the design is exactly the same. The buildings are mixed use buildings with a retail unit on the ground floor and uh, six, five stories above. <clears throat> They're comprised of, comprised of 10 units, nine one bedrooms and one two bedroom. There's a shared laundry in the cellar, a rooftop available for, a rooftop terrace um, available that will provide outdoor space, outdoor space for all of the unit owners, um, as well as accessory storage as noted in Chauncey. Um, the developer is seeking to find a retail tenant that will both benefit the community as well as the unit, or, unit owners. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> as I mentioned, 890 is the sister building to 772 Myrtle. Um, same design, as well as same unit makeup of nine one bedrooms and one two bedroom with a rooftop available uh, for all of the unit owners to enjoy landscaped accessible outdoor space. Next slide, please. The, build, the biggest building in the cluster is 119 to 125 Vernon Avenue, which features 18 units, <clears throat> four of which are one bedrooms, 14 of which are two bedrooms. Similar to Chauncey, this building is set back from the street, which provides a buffer and some quiet for the unit owners on the ground floor. This building also features uh, outdoor space in the back, a landscape rear yard that provides separate spaces for those that would like quiet enjoyment and a separate sort of recreational children's play area. It also has a third outdoor space, which will be on the roof deck, which again will be accessible to all the unit owners. Um, there's shared laundry in the ground, in the basement, <clears throat> and it would also feature bike storage, a rec room, fit, rec room slash fitness room, as well as unit owner storage. Next slide, please. The targeted AMI mix, um, we have separated into two tranches, um, 90 to 110% of AMI and 111 to 130% of AMI. <clears throat> what you see before you are the AMIs based on 2020 AMIs. Um, this will likely be adjusted prior to the project closing to the 2021 AMI. The sales prices noted above are from um, Realtor and Zillow, which if, you, I'm sorry, the sales prices noted on the slide are a discount to market. Um, so if you're familiar with the sales prices in Bedford-Stuyvesant, you know that a one bedroom would be sold anywhere from 600,000 to 700,000 and a two bedroom would be north of 750. <clears throat> so these prices really represent a significant discount to market for the unit owners and should capture a majority of those living in the community as well as those living um, in the, as, as well as those citywide earning between 80 to 130% of AMI. Next slide, please. Um, so I, I jumped ahead too, too soon, but these are the um, market sales prices, as I noted above, but keep in mind that these are for co-ops. Um, and when you compare that to condominiums, these prices are significantly higher. <clears throat> Next slide, please. 
Uh, the marketing will be conducted through New York City Housing Connect um, and the project will adhere to HPD marketing guidelines. Restored homes will manage the marketing process as well as administration of the lottery. And the developer will work with Brooklyn Neighborhood Services to provide homeowner education as it pertains to financial planning. Restored homes will also provide training for the homeowners with regard to how to maintain the building as well as their individual units. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this developer has, uh, Shelter Rock Builders has developed in central Brooklyn for more than 20 years, um, most recently in East New York, and is committed to hiring locally both in Bed-Stuy and the surrounding Brooklyn neighborhoods, and will participate as is required in the MWBE build-up program and hire um, local subcontractors and laborers through, NY through Hire NYC. Next slide. <clears throat> So to summarize, <clears throat> Bedside Central and North is 100% affordable home ownership, cooperative home ownership development developed under HPD's open door. The project will <clears throat> ensure long-term affordability through a 40-year real estate tax abatement, which is coterminous with the 40-year regulatory period. It's comprised of eight vacant city lots that will be combined into four separate sites to create 45 affordable cooperative home ownership units. And the targeted AMI range is between 90 to 130% of AMI. It's a mix of one and two bedroom units with amenities that include ample storage, landscape rear yards, washer dryers, fitness rooms, and bike storage. The building will be designed pursuant to HPD design guidelines, as well as enterprise green community. Next slide, please. <clears throat> well, that concludes our presentation and um, the development team is open, is available for questions. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up to my colleague, Council Member Cornegie. Council Member Cornegie, do you have any questions for this panel? Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Councilman. Yeah, so thank you again, uh, Chair Riley. Uh, my question is around the commercial spaces that are available. Um, certainly we're having uh, this crisis coming out of the pandemic for small businesses. I know you said that you wanted to make ensure that um, there were opportunities uh, for, for amenities to be consistent with the building and the surrounding areas. I ask that you'll work with uh, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce and the local bid to ensure that some businesses that have been displaced from the pandemic have the first opportunity to occupy that space. Um, so I, I if, if Ben, if I may speak on your behalf, I think, um, thank you for that suggestion, Council Member Cornegy, and we'll certainly reach out to the bid, um, as well as your office, once yeah. we're looking at um, tenants for that space. Yeah, we, we've, we've created a fairly decent trifecta of, of uh, the Brooklyn Chamber, uh, the bed Stuy Gateway bid, uh, and, and, and my office to try to try and provide uh, uh, for displaced businesses that have a proven track record, legacy businesses in particular, that have a proven track record of service delivery uh, to our communities, those that some of which are immigrant or minority owned to be able to, to stay. I, I'll have an offline conversation with you about, uh, about uh, that commercial space either being broken up so it allows for to be below market, but I'm not gonna do that on here. I, I, have, a, I have a larger conversation contextually with you on. <laughs> able to provide affordability for, for some of our small businesses that are clearly essential to the vibrancy of the Bedford-Stuyvesant fabric. So thank you. That's all I have, um, Chair Riley. Thank you, Council Member Uh So I just have a few questions. Um, so my first question is, can you describe your plans for ensuring MWBE and local based contractors and subcontractors participation with this development? Yes, good afternoon, Councilor Riley. 
So we have uh, completely other projects of HPD of similar uh, construction, and we have used NWBEs in the past, and we do have a list of contractors that we are working with on an ongoing basis. So I'm not sure what kind of assurances you need, but it is our aim to work with as many as MWBEs as possible in this project. We just completed a project in East New York where we had about 15 different contractors and suppliers that did work on the project. What sustainability and resiliency measures are incorporated into building design and construction? So for all the four buildings, we have uh, water control, water flow, so that it's not so expensive to use the water, as well as the strip mini systems that we are providing will save about 60 to 70% of the cost of the heat and air conditioning and electric on these units. These units will be 60 to 70% less than all other homes on the market for utilities. How do the projected sale prices of these units compare to the market rate condos or co-ops in the area? I, I think in all those presentations, she showed that the units are about 20 to 40% lower than existing condo units in bed -Stuy right now, where similar apartment that sells for 700 or 600, ours is going for about 350. My last question is, according to HPD submission, an RFP for these city-owned vacant sites was originally issued way back in 2005. Why has it taken so long to finally advance this project to this stage? This was part of an RFP from 2015. Not to, sorry, 2015. And the award was given to us in 2017. Yeah, excuse me, 2015, sorry. 2015 was awarded in 2017, and now we're uh, wrapping up to start construction as soon as uh, available. Um, Councilman McCorney, did you have another question? They got to unmute me again. All right. Yes, I do have a Well, I want to say to, uh, I didn't realize Ben was still here. I want to say uh, to him, uh, thank you for the shared commitment to bring affordable home ownership to the Bedford-Stuyvesant area. We know that we are the epicenter of gentrification and the ability to um, create wealth through home ownership and to be able to transfer wealth has been a primary concern for, for myself and, and my office. And finding responsible developers to get that done uh, has been incredibly difficult. So Ben, I wanna thank you for your partnership in this. And I look forward to putting a shovel in the ground sooner than later. <laughs> thank you, council member. And uh, I see Council Member Barron's hands up. Council Member Barron, would you like to ask your question? Council Member Barron, you're muted. Okay, is it unmuted now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a point to raise here. Uh, as Mr. As the, Mr. Trivoli has said, they just completed the project in East New York, a NIHOP, which I think was four private homes uh, that were constructed. And we are looking forward to the owners taking possession of those homes. However, there's a problem that's delaying that process being completed. And I wanna bring that to the table. And it's a problem where there was an extensive water bill that was somehow incurred during the construction. And it was my understanding as uh, that there was a problem as to who was gonna be responsible. And I was told that it was trying to be shifted onto the new homeowners who certainly have not yet moved in. So I would like to offer Mr. Chevolian an opportunity to clarify for me and to give me an update on the current status 
of that problem resulting that extensive water bill for the homes that he just completed constructing. Good afternoon, Councilman Ryan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Pleasure always to speak to you. Thank you. So these 13 homes are four three family homes, nine two family homes. And actually we did the groundbreaking together. Yes. With you and with uh, Diana Reyna and other dignitaries from HPD. Yes. Seems like a long time ago, it's actually about four years ago. This project went through the um, moratorium of gas where we couldn't do any work for six months. It went through COVID where we couldn't do work for another six to nine months. Yes. And most recently we had a bill as you referred to $120,000 of water charges that was never, uh, water that was never used. And we did reach back to DEP and ask them to review the $120,000. They denied it three times. Finally, through efforts with your office, and Ms. Joyce Simmons, and the um, mayoral office, they did reduce the bill from 120 to $40,000. And the $40,000 is going to be paid by us, the developer, even though we didn't use the water, even though there was no water access, even though there was nobody living in the building, even though DP could not provide any proof that we ever used the water. We're gonna pay that $40,000 from our pocket. And that is our intention. We never intended to have anybody else to pay for the water. We wanted to make sure that the homeowners do not and I repeat, do not have to deal with this at any time, not before and not after they close. We have a new coming to them and it's gonna be a very exceptional experience for them. Thank you. And I'm glad you clarified that because things were swirling around. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to clarify that and to ask what can be done moving forward so that this situation doesn't occur again. Is there some legislation that needs to be put in place? Or there's some uh, other ordering of the steps in the process? I'm sorry, ordering of steps in the process uh, that would eliminate that? How can, is this a common occurrence? I don't know if there's a city agency on the line that can talk about that, but is it a common occurrence? Is it uh, something that is a fluke? Why did, how, can it, how can we prevent this from happening again so that you or any other developer doesn't have this problem? of being charged for water you didn't use. Right. Right. I think it is a recurring um, occurrence with, with DEP, where it's had, it has happened in other districts that homeowners are being charged for water they didn't use. And I think DEP should be looked into and questioned why this is happening. It should be held responsible for any billing they send out. Okay, uh, that's about it for uh, for my compliment for my, my concerns and uh, questions. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. and we look forward to the uh, new owners getting the keys to their apartment and enjoying their beautiful new homes. Thank well, you. Have a ribbon cutting soon. Thank you. Great. There being no more questions for this panel, this panel is excused. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? On these items, excuse me. Jeff, you're you're muted. There are no members of the public registered to testify on these items. Thank you. If there, are, sorry, if there are no members of the public who wish to testify on these items, the public hearing on LU eight hundred three and eight hundred four related to the Best Eye Neha project are now closed, and items are laid over. The last item on today's agenda is LU eight hundred five. 
and the 72 age transfer of block 3950 and lot 50. This is the application submitted by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency pursuant to Section 72-H of the General Municipal Law for the transfer of a city-owned property known as Block 3930, Lot 50 in the borough of Staten Island to the United States of America, acting by and through the Na National Park Service. This proposed transfer will require that the entire property be used as an enhanced swamp and public access path in further hands of their environmental mitigations required by the South Shore Staten Island Coastal Storm Risk Management Project being undertaken by the federal government. This project is in Council Member Mateo's district. Council, please call the applicant panel. The applicant panel for this item is Carrie Grassi on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Council, please administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hand and state your name. Carrie Grassi. Do you affirm and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. And before I begin, it is block 3950, lot 50. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, you may begin. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, awesome. I'm Carrie Grassi, director of the waterfront of the mayor's office. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Uh, before you begin, can you just state your name and your affiliation and then you begin? Sorry about that. Sure, no problem. Uh, I'm Carrie Grassi, Deputy Director for Waterfront Resiliency of the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency. I'd like to ch thank Chair Riley for the opportunity to testify today. The Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency is responsible for ensuring that New York City is prepared to withstand and emerge stronger from the impacts of climate change. With 520 miles of shoreline, adapting to more frequent and severe coastal storms is a critical part of our work. We are currently advancing multiple neighborhood scale coastal resiliency projects across the city, including the South Shore of Staten Island Coastal Storm Risk Management Project. As you may know, this project is being designed and constructed by the US Army Corps of Engineers. It will span five and a half miles from Fort Wadsworth to Oakwood Beach and will consist of a continuous stretch of buried seawall, flood wall, and earthen levee. The seawall portion of the project will be constructed on parkland managed by the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation and on Miller Field, which is owned and managed by the Federal National Park Service. Environmental review for the project concluded that construction of a flood control structure on the Miller Field property created an impact on national parkland that needed to be mitigated. Together with other project partners, the city will fund the mitigation project and will enhance the existing swamp white oak forest located on the northeast corner of Miller Field and build public access paths. To enhance the forest and the action that is the subject of this hearing, the city will transfer the newly apportioned Staten Island Block 3930 Lot 50 which is 6.83 acres of city owned vacant land at New Dorp High School to the National Park Service. Under General Municipal Law 72H, the mayor has the ability to transfer property to the federal government. This type of action has a recent precedent in the 2016 transfer of Christopher Park in Manhattan from the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation to the National Park Service. Although General Municipal Law 72H does not require a public hearing, for the purposes of transparency and following the precedent of Christopher Park, a voluntary public hearing was held by the Mayor's Office of Contract Services on April 14th, 2021. The mayoral authorization document was then issued on April 27th, 2021, and was subsequently transmitted to Council. It is our goal to support the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in advancing this project as quickly as possible, and this 
property transfer is needed for the project to move forward. Unless council has concerns, we plan to proceed with the transfer in order to avoid delays to the project's construction timeline. Thank you. And I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, just one question. Does the city believe this proposed site selection will be the only action needed to mitigate the potential adverse impact to Miller Field outlined in the environmental review documents? Uh, yes. So it was determined that for the Miller Field impact, um, so there's both uh, improvements to the existing uh, forest with uh, uh, pathways and then um, this transfer of land because uh, mitigation on National Park Service land has to happen on National Park Service land. So this is the entirety of, of, that, of that mitigation. Thank you. Uh, Council, are there any questions from any council members? There are no questions from any council members. Thank you. There being no more questions for this. Oh, there is a, there is a question from Council Member Barron. Council Member Barron, go ahead. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Just want to ask generally, were there any uh, advocates or persons involved in this that were opposed to that transfer of the park that you referred to? I no, not at all. Um, there's widespread support for this project and for getting everything done that we can to move this project forward. Um, the existing property again is forest. It's not used for educational purposes. So there was a lot of support actually in transferring it back to the National Park, Park Service. Okay, great, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. There being no more questions for this panel, uh, this panel is now excused. Thank you. Thank you. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on these items? There are no members of the public reg registered to testify on this item. There being no members of the public who is to testify on this item, the public hearing or LU805 related to the transfer of block 3950, uh, lot 50 in Staten Island pursuant to section 72H of the general municipal law is now closed and item is laid over. That concludes today's business. I remind you that if you have any written testimony on today's item, you may submit it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number or the project name in the subject heading. I would like to thank the applicants, members of the public, my colleagues, subcommittee council, land use staff, and Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you, everyone.